Good morning! Today we will be discussing my pedagogical platform for EWL 120, Themes in Literature. The design of my course is informed by two literary theories, post-colonial theory and eco-criticism. Dialogue between the two theories has been underway for a while, with many critics such as Hugin, Tiffin, and Crosby working to articulate the space between post-colonial and environmental studies. Given the global environmental crisis, it is important now to understand the evolution of the relationship between society and environment, and critically reading literature through an eco-critical lens can shed light on this evolution. This brings us to the theme of my class, the development of society's attitudes towards nature and literature. By the end of the course, each student will have to think critically about literature's role in the changing relationship between nature and civilization. They must also answer several questions. Did colonialism specifically cause a change in the attitudes towards nature? How has the environment been affected by colonialism? In what ways does literature play a role in deciding a culture's relationship to the environment? So we know that new colonial cities fundamentally change the relationship between people and nature. But this course is designed to study more than the history of ecological destruction by colonialism. As Hugin might imply in his book from 2008, Interdisciplinary Measures, Literature and the Future of Postcolonial Studies, there is evidence of a postcolonial turn in attitudes towards the environment. By studying a piece of literature's relationship to nature, we can clearly see a shift from an ecocentric attitude to an anthropocentric attitude. This means that where we once see a view that the interests of the biosphere of the the biosphere of the world must override that of the interest of, the, of an individual species, like humans, we now see a view that the interests of humans are of a higher priority than those of non-humans. This shift in attitudes is most clearly articulated through several works of literature when reading with post-colonial and eco-critical theories. This course is parsed out into sections, which will help the students notice and track the transformation of attitudes. Four of the sections include more than one work. The first section of the course focuses on two very different types of poetry. Several poems from the 8th century Chinese poet Li Po are compared and contrasted with Geoffrey Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls. These poems seem so different, especially in the language and symbolism, but they all explore an author's relationship with an attitude toward nature. Close reading must be applied in order to compare and contrast. This will be the student's first exposure to ecocentrism, and they will be required to define this key vocabulary term as well as several others. The second section turns to The Smallest Woman in the World by Clarice Lispector. The main character, Little Flower, is exploited for the amusement of, an, of a European public because she is perceived as less than. It is also important to note the role that nature plays in the text is most noticeable towards the end of the story when the little flower mentions how nice it is to possess a tree she lives in. It is significant that her pride first comes from her realization that she possessed a tree, a piece of nature, a resource in her land. This short story illustrates changing attitudes that dismiss both a subaltern and the natural resources as expendable. The third section returns to poetry. The poets in this section are both of European descent. Song of the Redwood Tree and Pioneers of Pioneers by Walt Whitman and Floating Island by Dorothy Wordsworth are poems that spend time exalting nature. However, especially in Whitman's poetry, westward expansion is encouraged and the land is seen as something to conquer. While Whitman mourns the loss of nature, he suggests it must be done for the sake of the United States' progress. A desire for westward expansion demonstrates a way in which humans are now starting to put themselves before the needs of the biosphere. The section shows a marked shift in attitudes towards nature in literature and poetry, particularly European and American literature and poetry. The fourth section is meant to focus on a new callous attitudes towards newly colonized people as well as the environment of these colonized areas. This is exemplified by the tandem reading of Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, and an image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness by Chinua Achebe. The works will be read in that order in order to reinforce teachings on literary theory. Eco-criticism also works its way into Heart of Darkness.
Conrad shows a widening gap between civilization and the environment through his varying descriptions of the Congo River and the Congo Free State, as well as the way he contrasts the Congo River with the Thames. There is also an often overlooked portion of the story which illustrates the horror of the ivory trade, the commercial, often illegal trade of ivory tusks of African elephants. The fifth section comes back to poetry for the last time, this time centered on two poets of color. This section includes A Memory of June by Claude McKay and An Ode to Tomatoes by Pablo Neruda. In a time of industrialization with colonial structures crumbling all around the world, these poems seem to indicate a desire to reconnect with nature. It then may be helpful for the class to compare the attitudes of McKay and Neruda to other poets and novelists we discussed earlier. Here is where the students are really supposed to make informed opinions about the transformation of the relationship between nature and people. The sixth and final section delves into the events of the apartheid in South Africa and the social, economic, and ecological ramifications. The class will end with this single novel, Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Patton. Apartheid, racial tensions, and the seizure of, nat of native land in South Africa are all significant concepts because they illustrate a way in which imperialism not only exploits the resources of a colony, but also destroys ties between indigenous people and their traditional lands. This section will attempt to bring the course back to the present era and demonstrate the ways in which colonialism deeply affects populations for centuries. However, Patton was a white male writer. The class should be asked how they feel about a white writer writing about apartheid in an African country. By the end of this class, students will be able to identify and articulate how, historically, attitudes towards nature have transformed with the advent of colonialism.